today's traffic is the product of the transport policy which originated in the 1950s. For 13 years, between 1951 and 1964, the Conservatives held power. They encouraged private motoring at the expense of public transport, even though public transport is safer, creates less noise, less pollution, and uses less energy than the private car. There are few signs of any alternative to this pro-road approach, and those that exist originate from the policy enacted by a Labour government in the late 1960s. This began with the appointment of a new Minister of Transport in 1965. Transport Minister Barbara Castle, escorted by the Chairman of the British Railways Board and other high-ups, visited the Railway Technical Centre and toured the workshops. Half of British Railways' new carriages are manufactured here. A welder's eye view now. I had the job of trying to work out and reintroduce an up-to-date, integrated transport policy. The Labour government in '45 had uh, produced such a policy in its 47 Transport Act. It set up a British Transport Commission to, call, to, to operate together all the road, rail, canals, shipping, and passenger freight services. But the Conservatives had dismantled this, and uh, we, the British Transport Commission had gone, and the party wanted a transport policy reintroduced, which would plan all these forms of movement of people and goods together. To make this policy possible, the government was prepared to provide grants to support some public transport services. The details were outlined in the 1968 Transport Act. This act was the first sign of revived interest in public transport, which had been off the official agenda for years. It was at last realised that car users, though a minority, affected the travel methods of the majority of Britain's population. In socialist terms, though, the act was a retreat from the mid-1940s. There was no mention of renationalisation of road haulage and no intention of re-establishing a centralised body with overall control of transport. The act had three main aims to use the new grants to enable country railways to remain open, to set up a regional structure to develop public transport in the cities and in the rural areas, and to revitalise the movement of freight by rail. The objectives were already established by the time the conflict in the Middle East had cast its long shadow over the West's confidence in the economic boom which Britain had enjoyed since the early 60s. The Six-Day War of 1967, between Syria and Egypt on one side and Israel on the other, illustrated the vulnerability of the imported oil needed to fuel Britain's private cars. One of the first results was that oil-producing countries banded together and forced a 70% increase in the price of oil, with the possibility of supplies being halted altogether. This should have had a major impact on transport policy in Britain, but there was no sudden retreat from the road-building programme. A lot of heavy traffic travelling between Lancashire and Yorkshire passes through the centre of Manchester. From now on, it'll use the new Mancunian Way. Nearly a mile of it runs at 20 feet above street level. Increasingly, railways lost out to roads. Barbara Castle hoped to give public transport users, the majority of the population, a fairer deal. But she accepted the drift to the private car and was not about to reverse the beaching railway closures. So one had to take account of the fact that the railways would have to change. Some trimming would have to take place on certain uh, now superfluous lines, but in other directions, one would need to keep non-paying railway services open for social reasons, either to prevent the complete isolation of a rural area or to um, relieve the congestion in cities by expanding commuter services by rail. So I set up a joint steering group between uh, the department, the British Railway Board and outside experts to look at the railway system, decide what size railway system we needed on social grounds and then uh, identify those uh, services which were loss-making and then decide what the cost to the British Railways was of those services and pay them a subsidy for them. In terms of subsidy, Britain was the odd one out. Almost all her European neighbours supported their public transport heavily and many people had been arguing in Britain for higher transport subsidies. It wasn't until the 1968 Act that any steps were taken in this direction. 
Even these grants were restricted to loss-making services, largely in rural areas, or providing short-distance links between towns. But of course, this didn't make much impact on the travel inside large towns. This was another problem which required a separate solution. What we had to do was to give public transport, its promotion and its subsidization, a much, much higher priority. And so I set up passenger transport authorities in for these urban areas on which representatives of British Rail as well as passenger transport bus services and, and the local authorities were represented. And I put it to them that we would give them new grants uh, for, for instance, uh, building new buses, for having interchange facilities that should enable people to move from road to rail under cover without going into the rain and uh, uh, definitely improving in all sorts of ways the infrastructure of public transport. One of the first areas to benefit was Tyneside. In place of 20 authorities, one large body was given powers to plan public transport for a very wide area. The old system was biased towards roads. Like many British towns in the 60s, Newcastle was ravaged by urban motorways. But the previous local authorities had had the foresight to commission a major study covering the development of all forms of transport serving Tyneside. The transportation study looked at a whole series of different alternatives. Only new road construction, upgrade the existing British Railways track, significantly improve buses and close down the railways, uh, tear up the existing British Railways track, pave it over and run express buses, and the metro alternative. So all of those were examined, and the transportation study recommended the metro. We looked at that proposal in more detail, together with some of the others, like the express bus uh, proposal. The new passenger transport authority eventually decided to install the metro, a light railway system which would make use of the existing British rail track bed. Newcastle had had an electric train service since 1903, but 60 years later, under the beaching plan, the electric lines were ripped out and diesel trains were substituted. The trains and stations were allowed to deteriorate and were in a very poor condition when the new authority took over. The planned network was 34 miles with four miles underground. Although it mostly followed the old British Rail route, new tunnels and bridges had to be built. The actual construction started towards the end of 1974 when we started to uh, build the first uh, tunnel section and it came into operation in 1980. So the total construction from conception was roundly 10 years. The metro is a cross between a tram and a train. Although the technology is common in Europe, it was an innovation in Britain, where public transport was conventionally either a bus or a train. The metro has many advantages over a heavier train, including smaller tunnels costing less to build, and the lighter trains have faster acceleration, which means they're quicker between stations. Time is also saved by simple ticketing. The area is divided into zones. Machines at the stations dispense tickets, which are valid for travel on both metro and bus. This system improves integration. It does away with the need for passengers to buy separate tickets for a single journey requiring metro and bus. Regular travellers have the option of buying a season ticket, which is valid on all forms of transport in the area. On buses, a ticket is available which allows transfer to the metro because it gives unlimited travel in the zone paid for, as long as the journey is completed in 90 minutes. Buses are important in Tyneside. Six times as many journeys are made on them as by Metro, and the council has introduced bus lanes and bus-only roads to help speed the buses on their way. But the key to the great success of the system is the coordination between bus and Metro, which goes much further than the ending of inconvenient ticketing. 
No less than nine bus stations are right next door to metro stations. The system is designed so that passengers can change from bus to metro with the minimum of inconvenience. 150,000 people use the metro each day in the rush hours. Two-thirds of these go on to complete their journey by bus, illustrating how the different forms of public transport complement each other rather than compete with each other. The metro has revolutionised the journey to work. Commuters from suburbs 12 miles out can reach the city centre in 25 minutes, and for the majority the journey is only about 10 minutes. The average fare is 30 pence. For most of the 34 miles, the metro runs over ground, travelling from the suburbs. A specially constructed bridge spans the Tyne from Gateshead to Newcastle. As the train approaches the city centre, the metro goes underground, travelling through new tunnels serving seven stations. The metro isn't just an efficient way of getting around Tyneside. It's also intended to be pleasant and attractive for the passengers. A great deal of care has gone into the design of these stations. Special surfaces are used which defeat the graffiti artist. The stations with their bright interiors create a cheerful travelling environment. Metro goes to many of the most important areas of Tyneside, including the industrial belt surrounding the dockyards and the busy shopping area. Newcastle's popular covered shopping complex is served by two underground stations. The Metro caters for people with disabilities and for parents with small children. All the 41 stations have either ramps or lifts, and at all ticket barriers there is at least one gate which is wide enough for wheelchairs. Weekends, the trains take day trippers and holiday makers out to the seaside. There's been a dramatic increase in the number of people visiting coastal resorts such as Whitley Bay or Tynemouth since the opening of the metro. The metro is more than just the backbone of the public transport system. It has become central to life on Tyneside. What we hoped to do was to increase the mobility in the northeast of England to give people the confidence to travel further for leisure purposes, shopping purposes, to encourage people to go further to look for employment because employment was becoming difficult. So we were, we were looking for greatly increased mobility at the same time that car ownership was increasing. But we also hoped to produce a very integrated transport system, a system where the buses and the rail system fitted hand in glove very exactly. Tyneside was one of the first passenger transport authorities. The second wave came with the creation of the Metropolitan Counties in 1974, following local government reorganisation. In South Yorkshire, the Labour Party won the local elections, partly on the strength of their transport policy. We wanted to stop the deterioration of public transport because we could see if we weren't careful, we'd end up with few passengers paying high fares on a poor service. And therefore, we decided to try and keep fares down and to introduce free fares for senior citizens uh, and to try and run generally a good integrated public transport network in South Yorkshire. It is uh, an urban area with four major towns, Rotherham, Doncaster, Barnsley and Sheffield. But of course we do have a fair amount of rural hinterland as well, so it's quite a mixed area. The metropolitan counties controlled roads as well as public transport. As we are also the highway authority, 
one of the advantages of the Met County is it can therefore decide what, which bus priority measures it wants, where it wants bus lanes, where it wants bus only roads and so on. Prior to the Metropolitan Counties, that was not uh, a very easy thing to do and certainly if the Metropolitan Counties are abolished, that possibility will become very, very difficult in, indeed to implement. The abolition of the Metropolitan Counties will almost certainly also mean the end of the cheap fares policy, which has been the keystone of South Yorkshire's transport. In 1984, the average fare was only five pence, and a journey of 20 miles cost just 25 pence. Initially, there was some opposition to the introduction of cheap fares. Well, it was controversial very early on, once people realised that we were actually going to keep fares down and so on. Uh, mixed response, ordinary people who used the buses thought it was great because their fares weren't going up and they'd previously gone up pretty regularly. Um, the press, television and so on, thought we were balmy, we were a bunch of left-wing extremists or something like this. It took a long time, really, for it began to permeate through that this, in fact, was a very sensible transport policy, whereas a, a new county council, we could actually say, well, we won't tear cities down to build motorways, we'll have lots of buses instead and we'll keep fares down and serve the public that way. There was nobody else in the country doing it. In Europe, on the other hand, that sort of policy was in existence. We didn't actually know it at the time. We went ahead very much off our own bat and, and previous research, theoretical research has shown that you, you could perhaps stop uh, the loss of passengers by holding fares down, not that you could increase them. We believe that we could stop the loss of passengers. We believe that we could increase them. And that, in fact, is what we've done steadily over the years. South Yorkshire has a mixture of services, including a free bus, the City Clipper, which takes a circular route through the city, stopping at the rail and bus stations and the shopping centre. Outsiders are surprised by the lack of a ticket machine. But for local users, it's a frequent and extremely popular service. The cheap transport policy has been criticised, especially by commercial ratepayers, because it is heavily dependent on the rates. I'm surprised at shopkeepers sometimes. If, you know, they're supposed to know the, the way things work in the marketplace and so on. But it took them a long time to realise that the rates that they complained about actually were bringing them literally millions of customers a year into the centre of places like Sheffield. And uh, it wasn't until the policy was very much under attack that suddenly they began to realise this and, and they stopped criticising the policy. South Yorkshire introduced new bus services geared to specific needs. The most famous example of this is the City Nipper service which goes to Sky Edge in Sheffield where old people literally live in an estate which is on the edge of the sky and where the roads are very narrow and inaccessible. The services have been highly successful and in that particular case, the local community have really made local heroes out of the bus drivers who run the service. Um, they baked the big ice cake for the first anniversary of the service and so on. And that's been the typical response in South Yorkshire to the introduction of the Nipper services. South Yorkshire aims to meet the needs of the disabled by putting on special bus services of the kind they already run in Barnsley and Doncaster. The Transport Authority manages the British rail lines within their area and has improved services and held down fares on trains as well as buses. The overall improvements to passenger transport has naturally affected the number of passengers carried. It has increased by something like 7% over the last eight or nine years, which might not sound a great number, but remember that all the academics told us it couldn't be done anyway. Secondly, during the same time, the other passenger transport executives in this country lost 25% of their passengers. What we've found is that the traditional uh, customers of public transport are, are still with us. Most of the passengers on, on the buses are, of course, women, but there have been some other interesting facets to it. The biggest increases have come amongst children under 15 and amongst young adults. The older generation are obviously grown up during a car owning generation and they're, they're tied to the car. But the new generations coming through are very much public transport minded in South Yorkshire, which bodes well for the future 
success of the policy. We see mobility uh, as a right for, for people, whether they be the old, the young, the housewife, or whatever, and we've certainly achieved that in South Yorkshire, and we're very proud of it. Yes, it's a socialist transport policy in operation. But South Yorkshire's policy is unfortunately not all that common. Next door in West Yorkshire, the authority has had a different approach. The council has changed political control several times in the last 10 years, and there's been no consistent policy. Fares were frequently increased, discouraging people from using public transport and perpetuating the cycle of decreasing passengers, decreasing services and long waits at bus stops. West Yorkshire has tried to integrate its rail and bus services and modernise its public transport. But with infrequent services and high fares, the public is discouraged from using the system and certainly motorists have no incentive to leave their cars at home. Policymakers have suffered from the 60s conception of cars as a liberating experience, but the reality is one of countless cars, no space free of them, with public transport passengers waiting endlessly for buses on wastelands between urban motorways. Two of the seven transport authorities are carrying more passengers now than they were ten years ago. South Yorkshire has increased the number of passengers by 7% because of its cheap fares policy. In Tyne and Weir, the number of passengers has increased by 10%, mainly due to the opening of the metro. All of the other five authorities have lost passengers. West Midlands lost one in eight of theirs. Merseyside lost one-fifth. West Yorkshire and Strathclyde both lost about one-third, and Greater Manchester lost half of its passengers. These figures partly reflect differences in local policy, but central government has also been an influence. In the early 70s, Manchester and Liverpool asked for funds to improve their public transport infrastructure, but unlike Tyneside, they were turned down. By then, the government was not serious about investing in public transport, a decade later, central government adopted an even more negative stance, evidenced by rate capping, and plans to abolish the metropolitan counties and with them the public transport authorities. This proved very unpopular and provoked an increasingly rebellious response. Demonstrations have taken place up and down the country against the abolition of the metropolitan counties. The biggest was in London in spring 1984. Abolition will prevent the effective coordination of public transport regionally and encourage local rivalries. Together with rate capping, abolition is specifically designed to end South Yorkshire's cheap fares policy, as the government takeover of London Transport was designed to end cheap fares in London. But the abolition will also inhibit imaginative schemes like the Tyne and Weir Metro. In effect, these proposals, if carried through, could put an end to the only two policies that have won people back onto public transport.